I assume you can see my slides right now, so I'm going to talk through the slides and just give you some of the issues that we face. But um, many of you uh, will recognise this picture, and I think when I show this picture, it, it, it makes me think about what does it take to change the way we think about medicine, the way we think about drug regulation. And this is a very visual, important image because it's almost like we have to get to the point where it's so obvious to everybody that there are issues, that that's what changes our viewpoint around evidence. But within the context of thalidomide, there's uh, this lady uh, that many people won't recognize, but some of you may. This is, but you'll recognize John F. Kennedy there. And on the left is a lady called Frances Kelsey. And Frances Kelsey here is receiving from John F. Kennedy the Bronze Medal, which is one of the highest honors in terms of at the time in the USA. And that's because Frances Kelsey worked for the FDA and refused to allow thalidomide into the US unless it was uh, used within the context of a clinical trial. And that meant uh, within the UK and Ireland, uh, we were 100 times more likely to see children with thalidomide than in the US. And she's receiving a medal because this led to the birth of clinical trial regulation. The realization that we needed clinical trials, and we're only going back now into the 50s, when 60s, that the need for clinical trials became important. And I, uh, as you heard at the beginning, always had an interest in drugs and devices. And I brought this up because um, this is one of the times when I certainly realized there were huge issues in how we regulate drugs and devices. And this is our involvement in the metal hits. But what surprised me about the metal hits and the fiasco that ensued was a, a particular piece of evidence that I started to realize that some of our systems are just not fit for purpose. And one of the issues that is the Medicines and Health Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, actually I realized does not actually even see the clinical generate data generated from clinical trials prior to it being submitted for approval. And that's a point over the last 10 years where we've really questioned, do our regulators keep us safe? Do they actually do the job that we think they're employed to do? And so, no one really I considered, with particularly in devices, but I, I think within drugs there are real issues about safety. And um, you'll be aware in the UK that one of the issues about the ongoing problems with devices and drugs is that we launched a review in response to concerns from free treatment. M3 treatments are primidos, vaginal mesh implants, and the anti-epilepsy drugs which we're here about today, sodium valproate. And it's not often our ministers in the UK do very sensible things, which you'll appreciate right now is, is very pertinent given the issues of what we're talking about in the European Union. But I actually think Jeremy Hunt here uh, did one sensible thing in ordering the three to you in saying that patients are not being kept safe. And I think it's interesting, why did this review come about? You might want to discuss this as you go through the day. It largely came about because of patient groups. It didn't come about because of the regulators. Didn't come about because of doctors. Didn't come about because of academics. It came about because patient groups, for the first time I consider in healthcare, in three distinct areas, mobilized themselves to a point where they said, we have had enough and we're going to work with our politicians to, to effect change. And I think that has been a really important message. Now, um, many in the room will be aware of the danger of Valkyrie and pregnancy. And we're clear that in 2018, we, the European Medicines Agency recommended it should not be used in pregnancy unless the woman has a form of epilepsy that is unresponsive other anti-epileptic drugs. And the evidence is very clear 
that there's an increased risk of exposed children are born with congenital malformations, three times higher risk than in the general population. But what really interests me is, so if we knew that actually there's an increased risk, the big issue in any decision making is were women fully informed at the time when they were potentially becoming pregnant or pregnant about the risk? And that led me with my colleague, who you just heard from, Jeff Aronson, is we're particularly interested in this question. Who knew what and when? When was the point when you should first be informed about the risks? This is an incredibly important question to ask, to ask in any situation. And I'll give you a good example, for instance, where this is important. If you consider smoking of cigarettes, is that it seems the most important time point in cigarettes was 1974. Because before 74, there were no warnings. So anybody smoking cigarettes before 1974 can still seek compensation. But the argument is after 74, we knew the risks, and then the warnings were made clear to everybody. And so that idea is very important and why Jeff Aronson and myself did this piece of work. Before I get to the findings, I want to just go back through what do we mean by evidence-based medicine. And this is uh, the father of evidence-based medicine, my mentor, David Sackett, who was the first director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine. It's a triad of three basic principles. Finding the best available research and integrating that with expertise and patient values. And all of them three are incredibly important to ensuring the best decisions and actions. And within evidence-based medicine, there's a, there's a hierarchy of evidence that we use to inform decision-making. At the bottom of that hierarchy is editorials and expert opinions. So when an expert's talking to you in the absence of evidence, you have a problem. And here's one of the best examples of expert opinion. The question there, and there may be people in the audience who wrote, would you ever put babies to sleep on their tummy? Well, if you go back 30, 40 years ago, many people, and some people in the audience, might actually have owned a copy of this book, Benjamin Spock's Baby and Child Care the most widely recommended handbook for parents ever published. Actually, it sold 50 million copies, only outmatched by the Bible. <laughs> um, the recommendations from this book were exactly as the front cover. The physiological mechanisms were assumed that if you put your baby to sleep on their front, that if they vomited or had any problems, that actually would be better for them to sleep on their tummies as opposed to sleep on your back. Now, incredibly interesting expert opinion led for 20, 30 years a mechanism of how to put your child to sleep. However, with the advent of higher quality evidence, systematic reviews, that information was overturned within the concept of this systematic review which you can now see. Now here, on the left, is all of the individual studies that come together to show you that if you put your child to sleep on their front, you increase the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or fall. Quite a significant increase. Now I want you to also see, I'm just pointing here on the right, is what we call a cumulative, cumulative meta-analysis. Each single study adds up to provide a clearer and clearer estimate of the true effect with what we call the confidence intervals of that. <coughs> so as you can see, as you accumulate more and more evidence, you become more and more certain about this effect. But actually, it was very clear, even in 1970, that there was an increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome with putting your baby on your front. So in fact, Dr. Spock's advice was one of the worst advice probably globally, in terms of infant mortality. But we can reduce deaths by about, infant, by about one per thousand children 
if you put them to sort of bed to sleep on their back. Now, this is a point now I'm going to move on to the sodium valproate, is that this is the systematic review by Tonashima, which we consider is an incredibly inc important uh, systematic review that has largely remained hidden and not really been a, an important subject of discussion. But in that systematic review, what Tonashima did is do what we really wanted with the cumulative meta-analysis. And so in front of you now, you should have what is the cumulative meta-analysis that Jeff and I looked at. And I'm going to try and talk you through so you can get a real understanding of who knew what where. So this is the cumulative risk ratio of congenital malformation for all major malformations. Now the first thing to notice is this line here, right up the middle, is what we call the line of no effect. The square represents the average effect, and the wide lines represent the confidence. So if you go up there, I'm just going to show you slightly bigger, that in 1983, Koch published the first review of 46 participants, and showed a risk ratio of 2.4. But that was not significant because of the arms are quite wide, and cross the line of no effect. And so it was somewhere between 0.46 to 12.4. That means the true effect could be here or as high as here. Now, as you see the second study, you add in more and more participants. And you can see here, we start to show some of the important points. We put in 1990, the cumulative risk ratio reaches significance. And then importantly, what we show here in 2004, and an important point, is what we call a doubling of the risk. The reason we put doubling of the risk is because that's a very important point in British law for establishing causation. They call that book four. And at doubling the risk, UK law, law courts will generally say we are happy to establish causation. So you can see, 2004, we understood with 4,528 parties that there was an increased risk of 2.06. In fact, we even can be more concerned that in 2005, when there were 6,445 parties, not only is there a doubling of the risk, that the lower bound of the 95% confidence actually is doubled. So we can be definitively certain that there's at least a doubling of the risk, and it's likely to persist. And that's what you show with the extent of the continuation of the cumulative meta-analysis. And we were still collecting information in 2014. More than 20,000 individuals confirmed the risk is more than doubled. But we knew that as far back as 2004. And we knew it with certainty in 2005. Now, interestingly, that's all malformation. But if you start to go on the specific malformation, our work shows that when you analyze the data, you see that actually we knew this even earlier, that in 1992, just with 1,254 participants, there was a seven-fold increased risk in neurology, okay? and that that risk was actually somewhere between 2.7 and and somewhere near 18. So you basically can look at that and say, in 1992, with some certainty, it was clear there was an increased risk in neural tube so on and so And that's what that looks like in 1992, blown up. You can see it very clearly sevenfold, and the lower bound is more than two, the causative risk. So it's, it's important to then start to think, what can we, what, what do we conclude? Well, if you understand then basic principles of systematic reviews are the highest level of evidence, and use cumulative meta-analysis to inform the causative doubling of the risk, 
it's very clear to us that everybody acted too late. Regulators, governments, drug companies, journal editors, prescribers, and even other systematic abuse acted too late. And that you could basically consider from 1990, individuals should have been offered the opportunity to switch to treatments at the lower risk where they existed. And that's very much similar to what I said about when I mentioned the cigarette smoking. At what point do we consider the evidence was clear enough to provide it to patients to inform the public of what should have been going on in that dated 1990? And I think that's the major message within all of this. We know that the risk is this, but when exactly should we have been informed? I'm going to stop there at that point because I think that's the crucial element to consider. What do we think about, and the point to you is, in the audience is, what were you informed, how were you informed, and in what area it's after 1990, you can pretty much say the evidence was clear that the risk exists. Thank you very much.